Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Israel is a major topic at the last presidential debate before the election. Playing tennis for Israeli Arab peace, the Orthodox Jewish boxer fights again, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The United States presidential election is closing in, and in the foreign policy debate this week, President Barack Obama and Mitt Romney had plenty to say on the topic of Israel. Here are the highlights. What I've done throughout my presidency and will continue to do is, number one, make sure that these countries are supporting our counterterrorism efforts. Number two, make sure that they are standing by uh, our interests in Israel's security because it is a true friend and our greatest ally in the region. Everything we're doing, we're doing in consultation with our partners in the region, including Israel, which obviously has a huge interest in seeing what happens in Syria. Syria plays an important role in the Middle East, particularly right now. Syria is Iran's only ally in the Arab world. It's their route to the sea. It's the route for them to arm Hezbollah in Lebanon, which threatens, of course, our ally Israel. I will not cut our military budget. We have to also stand by our allies. I, I think the tension that existed between Israel and the United States was very unfortunate. They have to abide by their treaty with Israel. That is a red line for us, because not only is Israel's security at stake, but our security is at stake if that unravels. Governor Romney, our alliances has, have never been stronger in Asia in Europe, in Africa, with Israel, where we have unprecedented military uh, and intelligence cooperation, including dealing with the Iranian threat. If I'm President of the United States, when I'm President of the United States, we will stand with Israel. And, and if Israel is attacked, we have their back, not just diplomatically, not just culturally, but militarily. Israel is a true friend. It is our greatest ally in the region. And if Israel is attacked, America will stand with Israel. Meanwhile, in Israel, the current campaign season taking place there for an election in January seems all but certain to seat a majority coalition of current Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party alongside an ever-growing ultra-Orthodox contingent. This further cementing of ultra-Orthodoxy's hold on major government decisions will continue to affect a number of aspects of Israeli life where ultra-Orthodox influence can already be felt, such as in the removal of women from the public sphere in ever more areas of Israeli society. As we've reported many times in recent years, sexual segregation at the Western Wall, or Kotel, has seen increasing protests from religious reformists, and especially the group Women of the Wall, which fought for and won the right to hold women-led prayer services in an area adjacent to the Western Wall called Robinson's Arch some years ago. Women of the Wall, and particularly its leader, Anat Hoffman, have tried to find new ways to push for women's rights at the holy site, including bringing the Torah scroll and wearing prayer shawls while singing after services as they come to the Western Wall proper. Hoffman has been repeatedly arrested for these acts, but her latest arrest is particularly noteworthy. During the recent 100th anniversary celebration for Hadassah in the Jewish state, Hoffman led a group to the Western Wall where she wore her prayer shawl and sang the most famous and elemental of Jewish prayers, the Shema. She was promptly arrested for at least the sixth time in the past two years. However, this arrest, according to Hoffman, led to a violent reaction from police. In an interview with The Forward, she said she was dragged across the floor of the police station by her handcuffs and had her legs shackled. She went on to say of her arrest for public prayer at one of Judaism's holiest sites, in the past when I was detained, I had to have a policewoman come with me to the bathroom. But this was something different. This time they checked me naked completely without my underwear. They dragged me on the floor 15 meters. My arms are bruised. They put me in a cell without a bed with three other prisoners, including a prostitute and a car thief. They threw the food through a little window in the door. I laid on the floor covered with my talit. Hoffman's arrest took place in front of as many as 200 Hadassah members who joined her for the prayer service, according to Hoffman. At the Hadassah Centennial, delegates unanimously approved a resolution supporting women's rights to pray at the Western Wall. On the Hadassah website, the recent president of the Reform Rabbinical Association, Sikar, connected the practical political element with the protest. Rabbi Ellen Weinberg Dreyfus wrote, As a third-generation life member of Hadassah, as a rabbi and immediate past president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and as a longtime supporter of Women of the Wall, I commend Hadassah on this resolution. I question, however, the wisdom of granting the Henrietta Jold Award to Mr. Netanyahu, whose government has done nothing to secure the freedom of worship for women at the Western Wall. Please, my sisters in Hadassah, make your voices heard in a meaningful way and translate this resolution into action. Two other groups known for conflict in Israel are Jews and Arabs. One program seeks to have them trade the volley of bullets that has devastated so many for a volley of a different sort, 
Meredith Gansman reports. International sporting events like the Olympics and the U.S. Open bring people from very different places and from very different backgrounds together for the love of the game. But in Israel, one organization is throwing out tennis as a play for peace. Tennis anyone? The Israel Tennis Center has been asking children this question since 1976, when the first of 14 centers opened across Israel. The Tennis Center's Jacqueline Gladstein explained the vision that tennis could serve a greater good. They felt that by the kids playing on court together, Jewish kids, Arab kids, Christian kids, Druze kids, that they all would develop lasting friendships and understanding and that really extended to the families as well because the families would carpool and come to the courts and spend time together and really with a, they developed a level of understanding of each other that they did not have before. According to Gladstein, on the court, Israeli children forget their differences and learn life skills. Tennis has a very specific etiquette and rules of the game. It teaches self-reliance and self-confidence, and children are alone on the court having to make decisions. And as a result, uh, they then take these skills into life. The Israel Tennis Center says it's the largest tennis school in the world. Over 20,000 children have played there, and Nadine Fahoum was one of the first Arab-Israeli Muslims to participate. We had a huge coexistent tournament where we were playing tennis together, singles, doubles. We were just us kids being kids, you know, uh, looking back, it was huge. A former Israeli national tennis champion and graduate of Duke University, She's now an ambassador for the Israel Tennis Center to promote the game's ability to encourage coexistence both on and off the court. To see more of how the Israeli Tennis Center is fostering relationships, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. In down-ballot politics this election year, a race for a state Senate seat in Brooklyn, New York, has become a battle over what's being called a super Jewish district, one that has seen a great many Orthodox Jews cramped into that of a single state Senate seat after a recent round of redistricting in the state. Christianine reports on one of the major party contenders gearing up for the election. Democrat Simka Felder stepped up his campaign for state senator this past weekend with the opening of a campaign office in the heavily Orthodox Jewish heart of the newly redrawn 17th New York State Senate District. To aid his run against incumbent state senator and Republican David Starobin, Felder already has a campaign office in Midwood, Brooklyn on Avenue J, and his new office is located at the corner of 13th Avenue and 53rd Street in Borough Park. And its opening attracted plenty of local Jewish supporters, as well as political allies. We're opening here right in the center and the heart of the community right across from the famous Shoma Shaba Shul that has uh, services all around the clock. And I'm delighted to be back right in the heart of a district that I represented for many years in the city council. And I'm very excited to be with the uh, people who I look forward to working for in Albany to make permanent changes there. Felder currently serves as the city's deputy comptroller for accounting and budget, but said his time as a council member for the city's 44th district, which includes Borough Park and Midwood, made him sensitive to the needs of his constituents here and aware of how much more he could accomplish for them on a state level. The city council certainly is a place where you try to do the same things as you will do in a state with regard to helping constituents with their day-to-day -day problems. But in terms of trying to change legislation and the dysfunction in Albany so that people throughout the city, particularly in the 17th District, are able to gain the resources and the services they deserve without having to go back to elected officials regularly for smaller changes, that's something that I look forward to working on in Albany. Among Felder's political supporters who turned out for the occasion was the city council member who succeeded him, David Greenfield. You know, my support for Simcha is enthusiastic. I think Simcha has done an outstanding job as a public servant. As you know, he was my predecessor in the city council for eight years. He's someone who's really delivered for the community, he's brought resources to the community. It's a community with a large number of Jewish voters, so many that the 17th has often been referred to as the Super Jewish District a nickname Felder resents. I take exception to that name, Super Jewish District or Ghetto District or whatever else. 
the district, uh, there is no other type of district in the state that's described by and identified by religion uh, or by ethnicity, hopefully. That shouldn't be the way. The, the district itself has a substantial Jewish population, just like other districts throughout the city have substantial populations from various religious or ethnic groups. But the job, the job itself, to be an elected official is to represent the entire community and to do whatever I can to make sure that the constituents and the people in this district get the services and resources that they deserve. To hear more from Simka Felder about his top priorities should he be elected, please tune in to the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Contending for election is often compared to contending in the boxing ring, and with Orthodox Jewish boxer Dmitry Salida having recently won a fight at the Barclays Center, Meredith Ganson wanted to see if she has what it takes to go 12 rounds. The Fight Factory is where champions from an early age are made, and where Salida trained before his recent victorious fight at Brooklyn's Barclays Center. But I've never even been inside a ring, so we're going to have to start with the basics. All right, step one, I'm in. Boxing is only a couple of punches, okay. and it's important to be able to use them uh, in right sequences at the right time. The, the, the most basic and important punch is the left jab. Left, left hand comes out, mm -hmm. and it comes back here. Right hand always stays in position. Okay. It goes out, and comes back to the chair. Okay? All right. So let's, let's jab for three times. Okay. One. Good. Come, not, don't cock it back. Just bring it back to your chair like this. Okay. Good. Okay. Two. Turn your turn your fist. Turn it. Three. Good. Good. One more time. Four. Five. Come on. On to the right hook, similar to the jab, but with a slight twist of the body. Put it all together. Left, right, down. Come on, champ. Left, right, down. Nice. But it takes more than throwing a strong hook and jab to compete in the ring, according to Salida's trainer, Javon. Sugar Hill. You know, you're in there getting, taking punches and uh, you know a lot of punishment. And so you have to have a lot of heart. Uh, you have to have a lot of determination, a lot of will. I don't want to say a lot of skill because you can take a fighter with a lot of heart versus a fighter with a lot of natural talent. I, I would pick the fighter with a lot of heart over the guy with natural talent. I have the heart, the determination, but to see if I have what it takes to be a contender, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, who wrote the Bible? Many see this question as suggesting a dichotomy between religious fundamentalists on the one hand, who see nothing but the hand of God, and a traditional academic theory that suggests several very specific authors over the course of time. One man trying to find a medium ground between the two from a layperson's perch is Dr. Bencion Katz, a medical professor who has spent much of his life trying to tackle the various arguments and theories. He suggests both that the fundamentalists ignore a diversity of theories in the Jewish tradition and that the scientific analysis of academic figures lacks a lot of precision. He recently made the trip from Chicago to TJC Studio in New York, and here are the highlights of our interview. What was particularly interesting to me about this book was the idea that you're a man of science, you're a professor of pediatrics, and also a man of faith, you're an Orthodox Jew. And you've been trying to, I guess, square the circle on that, what seems to be for a, a quite a long time, and you've put quite a amount of research into a theory of the Bible that works for someone who is a man of science and a man of faith. Yeah, I think that's a fair, uh, that's a fair summary. Um, I'm an academician by nature. So I'm data driven, what, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, medical research, you have to be data driven to do medical research. And I don't shut off my academic brains when I think about Jewish stuff, whether it's Jewish history, Jewish philosophy, or, or Chumash, Bible, Tanakh, which is one of my loves. Um, so I've been reading about this stuff for a very long time, and, uh, and it seems to me that there are ways, as you put it, to square the circle, to talk about, um, to be serious and academic about your study of Bible, and yet to still retain, you know, a basic faith in Revelation, a basic faith in, in Torah, Moshe, Misenai, the, 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 the Torah, you know, is, is a divine product revealed to Moses, and, um, and, and to make some kind of harmony between the two approaches. And so to get into the, the, the core concept, content of the book. It's about the, di the documentary hypothesis, which to many people who haven't heard of it sounds like some really complex thing. But basically what it is, is it says the Bible 
in all likelihood, was not written in one fell swoop. It was, it was likely uh, created by editors who looked at several different source documents, who were sitting there with lots of different stories of the Jewish people over the course of many centuries, and put it together and, and made it all work. But at the same time, when they did that, for some reason, their editing wasn't all that great. Correct. And they ended up with a document that just reads like it was written by four people. Um, and so, uh, and so, what you've been trying to argue with this book is that, at least the most, uh, the most kind of uh, zealous of the advocates for that 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 theory, which has been around for more than a hundred years, and is most advocated by a man named Richard Elliot Friedman, uh, that that the most certainly the most zealous arguments of that theory have have some some overt errors. Correct. So, um, you know, anyone who read the Hertz Chumash growing up, which was probably the most popular English Bible commentary, you right, know, that for, was, it yeah. was the standard. It was actually kind of sad because it used to be in Orthodox synagogues, Reform synagogues, Conservative synagogues. It was really the first Hebrew English commentary on 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 the Torah. Um, right, anyone, and that's the Sancino one that we all know with the the navy blue cover exactly. with the white with the white border. Exactly, yeah. that's been around for a very long time, and unfortunately, recently now different denominations tend to use different Hebrew English chumashim, um, Torah books. But um, anyone who read the Hertz Chumash, Hertz deals with the documentary hypothesis to some degree, mainly in his end notes. Um, but basically, as you described, you know, there are a lot of things that appear to be duplicated in the document, in, in the Bible, which, which people who ascribe to this theory try to argue, well, one emanates from one tradition, one emanates from another tradition. And more important than the different sources is that they think they can link them up and that they think, well, if there's two flood stories that have been intermeshed and two creation stories that are side by side and two stories of the selling of Joseph, that they all came from one book and then another set of stories came from another book and that the, the biblical author or the biblical editor tried to put them together. Yeah. Um, and in the last hundred years, and this is what Richard Elliott Friedman popularizes in a lot of his um, best-selling books about the Bible, he tries to show that there's a lot of what he would try to call scientific evidence for this. And in my mind, you know, again, as an academician, as, a, as reading these things kind of critically, um, I don't see a lot of this as working as well as people think it works. You can see the full interview with Ben Sion Katz under the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.